So I've been playing Digimon Survive because you have no time to game. So yeah, I've decided to change up my format a little bit. I'm going to do a review series called When the Credits Roll. Basically the idea is I only do the review once I've seen the game credits roll. To add a bit of credibility to my reviews, as you know at that point I have played the main bulk of the game and seen most of the story. It's not just like I've had a crack for a couple of hours and made an opinion based on that. While I've done this for most of my reviews already, I kind of want to make this a formal thing going forward. So you know that what you're hearing is someone who's actually completed the game. Maybe not 100% of it, but as long as you've seen the credits roll, to me that's seeing most of the game. Apart from a few outliers like Monster Hunter. Anyway, this is an odd game. I've seen it labelled as 70% visual novel to 30% strategy RPG, or tactics RPG. Personally, I spent more time in battle, but then my Pokemon habit of gotta collect them all kind of kicked in, and well, the further you get in, into the game, the more frequent the battles become. As well, and this, this kind of suggests to me that maybe, I'm just spitballing here, that some of the reviewers that are saying this might not have played the game to the end because it does get quite battle heavy towards the end and while the initial starting chapters are more text heavy not unlike a lot of other tactics RPG I mean it does send the balance out a bit but anyway what I find funny about the visual novel label is that well a lot of like your tactics RPGs are very text heavy and story driven just look at triangle strategy reviews and they just kind of and they go on about how for an hour or so you can just have text before a battle happens, just clicking through the story. And while being story driven isn't always the case, many tactics RPGs do go heavy on the text. So, I mean, it wasn't unexpected, but I suppose it gets the visual novel label as you do an extra bit to the novel part. It should guide the conversations a bit more than a normal tactics game. And you have a lot more choice in around those conversation -y bits. Um, but yeah, the, the, you have a bit more choice in and around those conversation -y bits than you do in other like tactics games that tend to just tell you the story. But as I've never covered one before, what is a visual novel? Well, it's basically a book with extra steps involved. We could call most RPGs that thinking about it. But yeah, but anyway, what are we looking at? Well, Digimon Survive is not the Digimon you remember. That story of a bunch of kids going into a digital world and having a wonderful merry old time. No, this game, while having the kids going into a different world, it's a lot more shamanic in nature as opposed to digital. And it's dropped the happy-go-lucky feeling for a more dark and more mature theme and plot. We follow Takuma, or Takuma, Takuma, who is on a school trip after an earthquake and some nonsense finds himself trapped in an alternate world with a bunch of other campers and it's not long before they come across the monsters and well first contact isn't friendly until each person meets their fated monster and this begins their test for survival for the group are in a dark world where one of the, many of the monsters see humans as little more than a sacrifice as it's a visual novel the characters are very important as as it's through their eyes that the story is told so we have takuma the classic anime JRPG protagonist, brave, loyal, and just an all-round good guy. He takes on the role of leader without really realising it, due to it being in his nature to listen and guide people on the right path. He battles his mental demons to stand strong with his buddy Agamon, uh, who has many traits similar to Takuma, while also not being the sharpest tool in the shed. Then we have Al, who is, who is the mother hen of the group, kind, caring, and very unsure of herself. And also not one to force her thoughts and beliefs on others. She struggles with the desire for harmony and to protect everyone while being quite passive by nature. Her partner is Labramon, who is fiercely loyal. And while all the other fate monsters are loyal, Labramon comes across even more so. And then we have Minoru. Minoru? Minoru? Outgoing, friendly, kindly, nerdy. The, the outgoing, friendly, kind of nerdy one with the hero complex that's tempered by a nature that tends towards cowardice and mistrust. He wants to be someone everyone can rely on, but struggles with himself. His partner is Falcomon, who comes across a bit as the brains of the monster group. He embodies the being someone you can rely on trait of Minoru. And we have Ryo, an interesting fellow. He is very withdrawn and grumpy at first, 
and I thought he was going to be a kind of gangster type, but no, he's just not the most pleasant fellow. He doesn't really make friends easy, and as well, whereas Minoru is a coward but tries to fight it, Ryu just kind of gives in to the cowardness. His partner is Kunamon, who is a f kind of friendly monster but struggles because he doesn't speak English or Japanese or whatever language you want to listen to this in. Then we have Saki, the bubbly one, that seems to just want to make everyone smile, but seems, which seems to be why she is attached to Ryu, as she's trying to cheer him up, but underneath something is lurking. Floramon is her partner, and a monster that is very protective and a bit bristly in nature, like because she's kind of cactusy. Then we have Shuji, the oldest of the kids, and well, personally, I just didn't like him for many reasons. And pretty much just wanted to give him a solid punch to the face. His partner is Lotmon, who is the complete opposite and I just wanted to protect. And then we get Kato. These, the next two, aren't actually part of the summer camp. They actually live in the area. The first is Kato, the older local lad who's super protective of his younger sister and has a bit of an anger management issue. Drakmon is his partner and Drak, weird to look at, is a pretty chill dude. Then we have Mew, who is the younger sister of Kato and is a bit of an oddball. But since that has something dark happened to her in the past. Her partner is Sayakumon, who is quite level headed and kind of tempers Mew a bit, even though Mew is quite mature for her age. There are three more other characters, which are Haru, Miyuki, and the Professor. They aren't fated team members as such, but are integral to the story. But saying more would be spoilers. The characters are all pretty well realised, with a lot going on, and have to deal with some serious mental trauma, so be warned. The story itself touches on a lot of themes, from the basics of the kids trying to survive, Lord of the Flies style, to the previously mentioned each character has their own personal mental issues that we get an insight into, and it all wrapped around with dealing with grief and fear and such. It makes for a heavy plot of times, but in a good way. I personally believe that this is a great story worth investing the time into seeing. The game itself is divided into the visual novel sections and the tactical battle sections. The visual novel section, that's supposed to be 70% of the game, follows a common trend of flashing up portraits of characters talking with text scrolling along the bottom, sometimes voice, sometimes not. But there's no English audio, by the way. But these sections are divided into a couple of sections within itself. Free mode and exploration. These work in mostly the same way, one just having a set number of actions you can perform and the other one being more open where you just have to talk to everything to get to the conclusion. Basically in this mode, in these modes, you can move around the map that you've unlocked and they're just kind of nodal points, like options you can select. And in each area you get a crosshair like system as it's kind of like a static image with various bits you can interact with. Most of them are characters you talk to or items you can pick up. Um, but if it doesn't have a little title over it, then you probably find an item or a battle. Some areas also get glitchy, and by using your phone's camera, you can uncover what's there. The actually talking to characters works as you would expect it. You click through text, and occasionally you get a choice to make. And if you click the correct response, you tend to raise your affinity with that character. Affinity with characters is important as it results in different events happening, possibly to the said character, depending on how high or low it is. You also have your own personal affinity that changes as you select different options, um, kind of in the style of like a Shin Megami Tensei. And it, depending on what affinity you have at the end depends on what ending you get, and also affects recruiting certain Digimon. Overall, while it's a good chunk of the game, it's pretty simple. Then simple kind of extends the battle system as well. It's a pretty classic tactic style combat system, but it, every game has its own little quirks, and in this case, Digivolving is one of those quirks. Your fated partner Digimon, not the external ones you can get, can Digivolve up and down levels in the battle, but it does come with a penalty. By being in high level forms, it slowly drains your stamina. Not that, apart from the very early areas, this really affects you, as you tend to have the stamina levels to mitigate this, and you can pretty much just Digivolve from the start and carry on through the entire battle without having to worry, except for one or two longer battles where it might train you a bit. You also have a very small selection of special abilities that each Digimon has, 
We also have the classic facing effects damage, so front and back and side does different levels of damage, as well as damage types, so like elemental effects and your Digimon type, whether like a virus or whatever, does more damage to other ones of the opposite types. The last bit about combat is the option to recruit Digimon via the talk command. Another little quirk though is the talk option. Each fated Digimon partner can use talk, um, which allows you to select one of the human characters and depending on which one you select it will give that Digimon a particular buff, um, such as Minoru gives movement, Takuma gives an all-round stat buff, etc, etc. Um, to go with this, if you use talk on an opposing Digimon, you get the recruit option. And this follows along with the Megami Tensei formula in that Digimon will ask you a couple of questions and giving them the right answer makes them happy. If you make them happy, you then get the choice to either recruit them or get an item. Um, doesn't matter how happy you make them as long as you breach like the middle mark. Um, you can own the little bar that appears. The chance to recruit is actually completely based on your personal affinity. And if they are of the correct affinity to you, you've got a higher chance of recruiting them. Um, you can do something here. If you fail to recruit them, you can hit restart, which will restart the battle again. So you can try again and again and again and again until it actually works. A bit like throwing Pokeballs over and over again in Pokemon. Um, otherwise, if you continue with the battle and complete it, because you usually do this in free mode battle option, which is a node on the map, um, it changes which Digimon are in it each time. So by restarting the battle, while well, in the battle, you can make sure you get the Digimon you want. Overall, as I said, it's a pretty simplistic battle system, but serviceable. And even the goals of each battle tend to be either get to a specific spot or defeat the enemy. No complex tasks. It's not bad though, but it's simple. It's just not what some people are looking for in their tactical systems. Some people look for complexity and this doesn't offer it. So what's good about the game? Well, it's all about the story and this is one I like. The battles are simplistic and serviceable. And enjoyable but nothing to shout home about but the story I genuinely enjoyed and I actually felt things good and bad about different characters I wanted to see what would happen to them and wanted to un actually unravel the mystery surrounding the events the, the story kept me going in this one as opposed to the gameplay and I said and so what was bad about it well the start of the game is slow and it is slow to get going story and battle wise which I've seen this put some people off and the so-called true ending is locked behind the second playthrough, which I find incredibly frustrating. I personally don't have the time to play games twice very often. And yet, the battle system again is a bit lacking in potential. It could have really been something awesome if the game had entirely focused on it, as opposed to splitting it between the story as well. But it's okay. Before my final thoughts, what did the rest of the world think? Well, looking at Metacritic, it's called a 77 on the Switch version. So yeah, not bad, as anything above a 7 is, is, is alright. And it got a slightly higher from the user review, which is 7.9, so it's 79. So it's good. It's not amazing, but I think that sums up the game. So that's a correct score for it. So yeah, the game overall has a fantastic story and character interactions, which for me is why I played it until the credits rolled. The battle system I did enjoy, but that's just because I like this sort of game anyway and I'll play most of them, whether they're good or bad. But it ain't one to sh shout home about. I believe that this is something worth experiencing, especially if you can get it on a sale for cheap. It, the story is not what you would expect from when you think back to Digimon and Pokemon and that sort of thing. It's just not what you expect. So my actual final rating is give it a go.